Welcome to the Real Estate Heavyweights Podcast. And um, I am Ashton Hines, half of the Real Estate Heavyweights. The other half uh, of our podcast of this dynamic duo is Tavis Westbrook. He is out. He is floating in the Caribbean as we speak. Uh, he is on an amazing bucket list trip. He is documenting it on Facebook Live. So if you want to check in with him, he's doing a really good job of showing people around. But he and five friends, his wife and two other couples are floating island to island uh, across the Caribbean for 10 days. And he is a captain and two of the other people are captains. And so they're they are manning it themselves. It's really awesome. So he's out. I was out last week in Chicago with a, uh, a trip, another band trip. My daughter was invited to play at a conference there in Chicago. So we took the family up there, spent a few days up there, which was great. Came back just in time for me to get COVID. And then, uh, Everyone went down to Austin to spend uh, a few days for Christmas and uh, to see family. And that brings me to our guest today. We have an interview. And not only is it an interview with just some random real estate person, but it is a person who's been a great mentor to me. I worked with him for a few years uh, as I was getting started as a traditional real estate agent. He is an investor. He also is married to a very talented interior designer in Austin who happens to be my sister. It is the one and the only Dustin Mix. What's up, Dustin? Hey, Ashton. That was uh, quite the intro. Thanks for thanks yes. for having me on. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know that I'll be able to provide quite as much value as Mr. Tavis as he's <laughs> living out all our dreams. Um, yes. You know, just sailing around the Caribbean. Uh, yeah. You know, for ten days, and that's that's kind of why we're doing all this, isn't it? No kidding, man. I guess it's been you know it's been one of these things. He's you know we've talked on the podcast. That he has a a nice boat on Lake Louisville. It's a big boat. And so he's used to driving, captaining, whatever you want to call it, the larger boats. And the the guy that actually has a boat next to him, the slip next to him also uh, can captain really large boats. He's in the boat business and he's actually done this trip before. So they've island hopped. He sort of knows the ins and outs of how to, to do it. And so that planted the seed with Tavis and Tabitha, and they had sort of written it down of like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And it just worked out for them to do it. And so, yeah, he's, he's living the dream. And uh, I got to see one of his live streams yesterday, kind of uh, an odd twist. Uh, you know, I, I'm so glad to have met Tavis. I'm, I haven't been able to add a ton of value to him from an investment side. And he's he definitely put more into my life than I've been able to put into his. I, I'm, I bring the technical side, the podcast, the the editing of the the reels and stuff like that. I've helped him out a lot with that, but I'm actually happy because he has a listing right now in Irving and he's out. And so he put me down as the point person. And so I've been fielding calls for him as he's out and sort of playing this uh, intermediary. It's, it's a different listing. He mentioned it. It's a family member. It went through probate. The house itself has some issues and there's a lot of questions for people walking through. So it's been fun uh, being able to field those questions and hopefully can kind of help him out as he's out of the country. And maybe he can sell a house while he's in the Caribbean, which again, dream of everybody to be the able dream. to do business <laughs> yeah. and to do real estate business as uh, you're floating around the Caribbean. So anyway, um, like I said, you know, Dustin, uh, he was my broker for probably close to two years, somewhere two in years. there. Yeah. Right. When yeah. you first got started. Yep. I started with Keller Williams. You started with Keller Williams way before that, but I, I was with the Keller Williams office over in Flower Mound for about six months. It just wasn't a good fit. Called up Dustin. I was talking to him all the time anyway for all my questions and saying, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? I'm like, why don't I just join your brokerage? And so um, why don't you, why don't you get everyone caught up to, you know, the basics of how you got into real estate? I know you have a commercial background um, and then we'll kind of bring them up into today and, and we'll get, to talking about, uh, you know, your business, what it looks like now and you're investing on that, but how'd you get, how'd you get started? Yeah. So I actually got licensed back in 2007. I was in college. Um, and I was, uh, blessed to actually receive a scholarship at the university of Texas. I played football there during the glory years. And it looks like hopefully we're returning. Don't want to say anything to jinx anything like, uh, other people have done in the past, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, got a, got a chance an incredible opportunity. Um, but I had three medical hardship or three concussions. And so I got what's called a medical hardship, which at that time there was not NIL money. There was none of that kind of stuff. And so we weren't allowed to work when we were on scholarship. But once, um, 
even though I was able to keep my scholarship, I gave up my uh, basically position on the team and stayed in student coach for two years. Um, but during during that time, I was able to go ahead and I could work. I was legally in NCAA. I was allowed to work. And so got my real estate license. I wasn't a business major. I was education. And but knew I liked real estate and didn't know exactly why. But, um, you know, I know there was a lot of commercial real estate guys that donated big money at UT and kind of was in and around them. some, and so just kind of thought I liked that. Uh, and so got my license and leased just just to college students initially. But then I got an internship doing commercial real estate, uh, did tenant representation. Uh, so it's a little bit different. So all you did was represent leases. You signed three to five of the 10 year leases uh, on commercial property. Uh, and so was doing that for about two and a half years, uh, just right out of college. Uh, and that on the business side was, was really good. Just kind of getting that experience. It was, you know, hundred percent commission. And so you really had to grind and figure it out. And, you know, I think I made 40 or $50,000 a year. It wasn't a bunch, but I was 20, you know, 24 at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just really liked it, but it was kind of at that point in the career of like, Hey, can you pursue down this and this is your career or kind of, this is at a pivot point. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to wanted to do as young. Um, and so stepped out of real estate for a couple of years, uh, but then got married to your sister and w we moved to Austin. We lived abroad for a little bit. So we moved back to Austin and kind of starting things up again. And so got back into real estate, but went the residential side. And this was 2012, hmm. um, kind of when I, when I got in, kind of got in and really was just doing real estate. So I was just, I was a realtor, just figuring it out. It was good. I was younger than a lot of my friends and I at the time I had a strong network in Austin and so was able to kind of start that up at a good time. We were coming off that 2008, 9, 10, 11 down cycle. And so we were kind of on the upward trend. So it was an ideal time to get in. <coughs> uh, and so I've uh, done and still continue to do that as my, my main source of income, but have used real estate and the knowledge and everything that I've experienced over the past decade, really to, to, to parlay that into other businesses that are still involved around real estate, but allow me to kind of get multiple streams of income. And that's like the exciting thing in the entrepreneurial yeah. side to me long term that's that's even more so excites me than just selling people houses right those are one-off transactions but and yes you are building a business in that sense and having the referrals and all that come in there there, there is that but then you know kind of looking at now i've you know we've done some flips i've got some uh, rental properties and and all of that like that's the exciting thing with different things and avenues you can do yeah for uh, sure yeah, I was listening to a guy, Ricky Carruth. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, for for whatever reason, he's kind of popped into my my orbit on Instagram and then on YouTube. And and one of the things he says is he's a traditional agent. He has a big business, but he said you should always be your number one client, um, and you should be looking for yourself and trying to find investment properties or flips or like if you enjoy real estate and you're out there looking and you're spending time on the MLS and talking to other agents and other clients, like you should be finding stuff for yourself. And like, you're a great example of that where, you know, it's not like you have this, you know, I'm going to own 15 apartment complexes or I, I'm going to do, it's just like, you're kind of piecing it together. You've been very steady year by year. I'm going to pick one up. I'm going to pick this up. You got some momentum doing a burr when that made sense, when the, the rates were good. So um, a super real, like a very realistic, very doable plan from just a, a dude, you know, that happens to really like real estate, but honestly, traditional real estate, it's a job. So you could, you could, you know, be an engineer or a lawyer and have an income coming in and do the same thing you're doing as far as, you know, an investment here and there and flipping. So why don't you take us into that yeah, what was your first property you know how did you get into the actual investing side of the real estate okay it was 2014 uh i'd been a realtor for a year year and a half then um we megan and my wife and i purchased uh purchased a property in austin a little bungalow 1300 square foot three one <coughs> and excuse me i got a little cough like we all do from this christmas stuff going on so i'm gonna cough a little later yeah um, but we purchased right. that for two hundred thirty-five thousand back in two thousand and fourteen, um, and we went to get our financing. The lender told us would be fine, and then the lender said, "Oh, we need two years of tax returns." Hmm. So, you know, I didn't even being in real estate. That was still kind of I was in that learning phase of kind of figuring out financing, understanding, and that kind of stuff takes a long time. Yep. And so we're scrambling because this house was offered. You know, I think it was like two hundred and thirty thousand. We offered five thousand over. There were multiple offers. This was back before multiple offers were much of a thing. Our parents thought we were crazy. 
um, just because it was such a small house for so, at that, you know, what felt like so much money. Mm-hmm. And um, we were able to do some creative things. We had someone come in and actually co-sign uh, to get us the loan uh, to help get us. And then we refinanced out of it a year later once I had the two years of tax returns in order to qualify. Um, and so, but we almost lost it then, but we were so excited about it. And we knew that they had accepted our offer and then got another offer for 20000 over. And so we didn't do any repairs, anything uh, mm-hmm. that they didn't. But we used that. That was fun. We were newly married. Um, we did a lot of the work ourselves. Uh, your dad helped with a lot of it. It was a fun experience and getting to go, you know. But we spent about $25,000 over a two year period on that property, but then sold it in 2016 for around three seventy. dollars um, We had held, right, we held it just for two years enough so that we could sell it and then get that money tax free. Um, and so we got had all those profits and then that was 2016 so we thought let's utilize this and let's leverage this and not just go buy another property and a bigger one but let's kind of diversify it gave us the comfort level to do our first flip so we bought a flip we had the cash we rented a place we sold it and just said we'll figure it out let's rent we knew we wanted to do a rehab we kind of wanted to figure that kind of stuff out so we rented um but in the meantime decided let's flip a property um so we use some creative financing for that so i've got i for the financing that we used, it was basically a cash deal. Um, okay. But we had a network. We had a network of people that we just talked to and you just have conversations about. This is what we're doing and blah, blah, blah. And what you find, there's a lot of people with money out there. We don't yeah. talk about it. They're not openly necessarily talking about it. And I wasn't even necessarily asking for money when I would go to, go to some of these people. It was more like presenting them an opportunity, right? Interest rates at that time were nothing. And so a city, you know, they're getting 2%, 1% in a bank account, you know, and I kind of was able to go and offer 6%, which at that it's a great deal now, <laughs> you know, yeah. then it seems, it seems I hope like you still have that was, person's number. Cause I, I yeah. could use that. <laughs> uh, seemed like a great, you know, great return for them. And so they financed the deal for us. And so we bought it in theory cash, but then we used our own money to fix it up. Our, you know, uh, Oh crap plan was like, well, we're renting a house. If it doesn't sell, blah, blah, blah. We'll move into it. That was our security. I was all about like, okay, I need out multiple outs it can't just be one thing at this point i'm i'm figuring all this out my wife's figuring it all out um you know and so we so we bought that and then we did the rehab basically ourselves it was megan and i over there doing a lot of stuff i mean we gc did ourselves which was new at the time like figuring that out we had some contacts and connections as people that kind of helped guide us but we just figured it out we you know we were over there you know change of windows which we never should have done but that's how you learn and that's how you kind of figure right. out going through like grinding at that first one um well and you realize hey great. next time i'm gonna hire this out you know not oh, you yeah, can't really probably do that for to, everything but <laughs> right i would always do this i would have paid more than that you know you start, yeah. un- it really helps you to understand the value when you pay someone to do something like what's mm-hmm. it worth to you right like certain things are I, I never want I, I never wanted to learn and still don't want to learn how to spec I don't want to learn how to do drywall. I don't want to learn how to tape, float, all of that, you know. Um, but we, we went through that and started figuring that out. And, uh, you know, but we grinded. We cut costs anywhere we can, did whatever, you know, did whatever we could. But it worked. Like, we made, I think, almost 40K on on that. And we kind of caught the bug a little bit. At that same time, uh, we bought our first rental property. And this, at that time, this was 2015, 14, 15, 16, kind of right there. I mean, this was actually 2016 by the time we bought it. But I started listening to and getting very involved in uh, a podcast called Bigger Pockets. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was very grassroots. It was basically, it started as a chat room, essentially. And then it's now grown. I don't know if, you know, I I know you're familiar with Bigger Pockets, but I'm not sure your listeners who are. But it it was grassroots. And this is what it was. The, the What we're doing right now is what they did every week. And you, mm-hmm. I just, I'd go on jogs, walks, anything I could, just soaking up that information. You know, I'd retain 5% of what was said, but all of those little nuggets of value add up and you pretty soon, like it, it create. it was my education. It was my, yep. um, you know, going to real estate school, kind of figuring it all out and starting those conversations and researching and doing all that. So at that time they're, they're big in the, you mentioned it earlier called Burr. And so buy, rent, rehab, repeat kind of a deal refining it repeat Mm -hmm. uh, i think is what that stands for and so we wanted to try this so we bought our first rental property in mainer outside of austin it was a hundred and uh twenty seven thousand i think or one hundred thirty thousand. right there we bought it same deal we bought it cash 100 percent finance through our through a friend um and so you can also do hard money which is Mm -hmm. you know you pay a little bit more for there's you know, your own money, there's, you know, government money, and then there's private money, and then there's hard money. 
Yeah. <laughs> and each of those goes up in typically the interest rate that you pay. We had our own cash to do the rehab. We only did about 20,000 20, 20, 20, of rehab Okay. on that. So we're at that time, I mean, we're all in for, let's see, it was a, we bought it for 127 and we did about 10,000 of improvements. So we're all in for 147 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, not 137, not doing my math correct. It re- well, so then we go to a bank and now we want to get traditional financing. We've, we've got a tenant in there. We've got it leased and we go and get the, you know, go get traditional financing at that time. You know, still I'm at an interest rate of 4.75, which is incredible. I've got a tenant in there and it, when I finance it, it appraised for 160. So my all in cost so I had a loan on it for, let's just call it 130. I put in about 10 of my own. So I'm all in for 140. It appraised for 160. So I've, by doing all the sweat equity, I've done something called forced appreciation. So I've forced mm-hmm. appreciation on the property by improving it. And so then I go to the bank and say, hey, I want to get a loan. You know, hey, I want to finance this on a traditional 30 year, you know, investment loan. What can you offer? They said appraised at 160. We can all, you know, we can give you 80% of that value. I don't remember all the numbers. Can't do the math in my head right now. But in a nutshell, I was all in out out the door for twenty thousand dollars, and I yeah. had a hundred and hundred and fifty thousand dollar property that was you know cash flowing, um, you know, hundred dollars a month, two hundred dollars mm-hmm. a month, and cash flow is a loose term. People use that. I view cash flow as the rental income. So let's just call it fifteen hundred, you know, thousand dollars for easy math, uh, you know, and taking seventy five percent of that. And using that as actual income, counting that, you know, 5% for vacancy, 5% for capital expenditures, mm-hmm. another 10% ten percent for management and other kind of miscellaneous costs. Yep. Um, I think that's 20% and then 5% for capital expenditures, 5% for repairs. Yeah. And so, you know, when I did all that, I took out that 25% basically then and paid the note. I'm basically a hundred, two hundred dollars a month. And you're paying it but down, you're that. getting some tax benefit. So if you're cash flowing a little bit, even at first, you're doing, you're getting all those benefits, but then over the long term, you know, you're going to be able to raise the rent some, you're still paying it down. And then, you know, you're, you know, four, five, ten, 10, it really becomes more and more. Once you get into it and it, it works early on, you oh. should be good to go the longer you go. Yes. I mean, that's the beauty of real estate, right? In theory, over the long haul, you've got your debt going down over time and your value going up. They're running yep. in opposite directions. And that's where the power is. And for that property, we sold it in 2021, uh, uh, either 21 or 22 for 325000 Nice. You know, and then, yeah, we had to pay some taxes and stuff on that. We didn't roll it up in a 1031 exchange. Uh, don't need to get an any degree on that particular deal why we didn't. But the, you know, it, that that's a huge tool. I took we we took my wife and I basically took twenty thousand dollars and turned it into I say we you know we sold it for three twenty five. You got fees, all that. Say three hundred, you know, and we walked away with like one hundred eighty thousand. Yeah. Um, you know, so you take your twenty. I don't I don't know what those returns are, but they're great. They're fantastic for a four year or five year period. Yeah, for sure. Um, and like that's the power of real estate. And like you start getting momentum, you get two or three of those kind of going. Um, that's where it's fun. And I think. You know, I think a lot of people early on, uh, I think one advantage I really enjoyed it was creative financing, like mm-hmm. figuring out and understanding financing because that's a tricky thing. Like, and I, luckily being a realtor, had the experience of seeing different situations and all that from the third party perspective, being outside, you know, just being the realtor for clients and understanding how it works and how it operates. And then having a lender relation that I can ask all these questions um, because that, so that led into, we started buying property. We wanted to buy more of these, but the problem that we had then, and this is the Austin market was our rental, the rental rate of what properties would rent for. It didn't match. Like I couldn't, I couldn't put 20% down and have that thing cash flow. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find deals. The value of real estate went up too high compared to the rental rate where I couldn't make the deals work where they were cash flow positive at the end. So after mm-hmm. I run to write everything. So what we did is thought, let me pivot just a little bit. We pivoted and started buying some properties in Abilene. My wife went to school there. I actually coached high school football there for one year. Um, I had some good relationships. So it was far as three and a half hours from Austin. So I wasn't going to be able to go over and change a toilet build out. I was going to figure out some systems and, and hire people and contractors and do that. Um, which was a ton, I mean, which was a ton of, ton of fun. 
it, it was work. It was hard on the front end. Um, but we were able to, you know, I, I feel like we did the same thing. We did the same thing that we did on that Mainer property, except when I went to Abilene, everything was scaled down on price point, but the rental rates were higher. So I was able to just rinse and repeat that same thing. And so we started buying properties there, I think, in 2019 or 20. And this is we, this was what was crazy at this time when you're doing the burn method and that kind of stuff. We we bought our first property there for sixty thousand. We put twenty five thousand into it. We're all in for about eighty five thousand. It appraised for one hundred and twenty five thousand. Mm. We used a local lender lender there, so not a Fannie Mae Freddie Mac back loan. Uh, we used a local lender. They actually it's actually a, considered a commercial lender is how they look at it. And we went to them and said, hey, we have this property. We, so same thing. We bought that. Uh, I actually got a partner on that. Um, and the partner brought all the money to the table. They basically acted as the initial bank, that private money. I paid, mm-hmm. we, we paid him 6% or something like that. That 85000 that we used, it appraised for one twenty five. The bank said, okay, we can give you 20% of that. We can loan 20% of that. And they so they gave us 100000 So at closing, when we refinanced that second property, we got a $15,000 check and that yeah. funded our business account. Now, that was 2019, 20. They started tight. Everything started tightening up after that. They go, oh, I don't like that. We just gave you $15,000. Mm-hmm. So the next deal we did with them, they said, hey, we'll give you the lesser of the two, 20% of the new appraised value or basically what you have in the deal. So we did about three or four more properties like that. And then they got even tighter and said, no, we want you to have 15%. I don't care if you bought it for 50 and it's worth 200. Hmm. We still want you to have 15% in the deal as as it got tighter. So we had to get more creative. We flipped a few properties there, but with a partner over a two year, three year period, we haven't bought there in over a year and a half. You know, we were able to get, we got 14 total properties. We have 22 doors. It's a combination of single family duplexes triplexes and quadplexes yep. all on 10, 15 and 20 year notes, depending on the property, because we don't want cash flow. We want enough margins in there so that we're not going to come out of pocket, but we really want to service the debt as quick as possible. Um, and so we structured each deal and each loan based on those kind of terms and what the rents were. And man, it's just been an incredible opportunity. I'm, yeah. you know, I, I, it's fun to say too, to this day, I've, to this day, oh, actually, I just put in five thousand dollars the other day to cover some taxes that we've got to pay, and we're selling a property that I'll get paid back in, in a month or so. But other than that, I hadn't put a dollar in any of those properties in Abilene. Wow. And like that's the that's the creative opportunity that markets shift over time. Like that that was then that was the opportunity then. Right now, there's a different opportunity. You know, we're trying yeah. to figure out what that is and understand what that is, and then you capitalize on that. So you got to be mobile and flexible. Yep. And that's like the beauty and fun. It's not the same day every day at the office. Like it's not the same routine. It's different. You just, you create, you build, you develop. It's yep. it's exciting. And I yeah. know you've experienced a lot of that. Oh, for sure. So yeah, man, I love your story. There's so much to unpack there. So let's just rewind just a little bit. Oh, and... sorry, kind of... No, you're fine. But um, so when you were in Austin and you decided to go to Abilene, there's a basic math formula that a lot of people use as sort of a barometer. It's called the 1% rule mm-hmm. and bigger pockets. will talk about it. It's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, if you're considering a rental property, most people would like for the rent to represent 1% of their all in cost. So for simple math, if you have a $200,000 house, you're all in financing rehab and all that you're in for 200, you would like for that property to rent for 2000. So Austin, similar to Dallas, you know, we have our properties, let's say over here in Plano, the average sale price is 400,000 plus minus. Well, you're not going to rent it for $4,000. You're going to rent a house like that for probably $2,200. So you're closer to the half percent, you know, half of 1% rule. And so that's not as desirable. You're not getting the, the cash on cash return. So people look towards markets that are not as sexy, you know, they're not as sexy. There, there might not be as much a uh, upside, you know, appreciation as an Austin or a Dallas, but you can cash flow them. So you look at an Abilene, you look at a, you know, maybe like a Wichita Falls or a um, Stephenville. And so I know we've had this conversation before. Abilene is great. And, you know, I know one of the things that you can look at there and sort of extrapolate is, you know, Abilene's got three universities. It has got an Air Force base. It's a medical hub for a lot of these rural West communities Texas. in yeah. West Texas. Yeah. So 
you know, you can look at that and say, okay, well, you know, Wichita Falls has a university. They're kind of isolated. They're a little bit of a medical hub. You have some of these other communities look around and the, just the buy price there is not, you know, you can buy, you can still buy a house over in near Abilene, probably for hundred grand, 80 grand. Is that right? I mean, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, less, less than that. If you're doing a rehab, if you're buying something, you know, a little two, one, it's already fixed up. It's in 90 grand, hundred yeah. grand. So if you're wanting those to get rent, involved in rent for 1100, yeah. you can buy something. Yeah. yeah. It's it's insane. So like, if you're wanting to get involved in real estate, it does not necessarily take three, $400,000. And I've got to, you know, it can be a, this small transaction that spins off a few hundred dollars a month. You rinse and repeat. Now what's changed in the market, the Burr method is, is not working as much right now because when you go, you can buy it cheap. You can, you can renovate it. You can rent it out. But when you go for the other R, the refinance, the market rate for refinancing, especially on investment properties right now, is you're looking at probably 8% or a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so whenever that 30 year note, you're probably not covering your rent. And so you're, you're you maybe breaking even or going negative. So it's just not as desirable. Now, you might have to put 30% into the deal or 20%. You can still make it work, you know? And so if you wanted to just go ahead and do it and hopefully in a couple of years be able to refinance, then you could do it that way. But the Burr method itself is not as much of a slam dunk because of the overall interest rate environment right now. And I know, um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, I know why you paused over in Abilene. It's initially, it's not funny, but I, so the distance, the distance investing is that scares me a little bit. I still like to go walk properties, you know, hug the front pillar. I know this is mine. I know this is like, I have a little bit of control over what's going on here. The distance investing is a little bit more tough. I know I had enough problems here with my general contractor and my subs and I knew them. I could talk to them and, you know, so tell us what happened over in Abilene and, you know, maybe a few lessons that you've learned moving forward as to why you paused and maybe how you would do it differently next time. Yeah. Um, okay. When we were, uh, there, we used our network in Abilene to find some contractors, kind of interview some guys, uh, and, and met this guy like, okay, he seems solid. I mean, the pricing was coming from Austin seemed like outrageously inexpensive. Um, and so I was like, let's go for it. He was great. He communicated. He did well. It was really a, a home run hit minus he was extremely slow. And when you're hiring a contractor, I heard this the other day. I feel like it's a good rule of thumb. And maybe I even heard it on this podcast was, uh, Tavis may have said it, but you know, you, you've got three pillars. You've got speed, you've got quality and you've got cost. And you can usually have two of those three. A lot of times maybe even only one, but you can't usually have three out of three. Yep. And so the cost was super cheap. The quality was good, but he was so slow. And we saw this opportunity of like, we want to buy more. Like I, once you kind of catch that bug and you're like, okay, I have no money in this, I'm getting this, it's an asset, it's $20,000 value, it's being paid down, blah, blah, blah. But, okay, let's run, run, run. Yeah. So <clears throat> I mean, he was just super slow. It was him and one other guy was basically this crew and he'd hire out a few, few guys. But we were, you know, we were doing decent sized projects. We were buying these 1960s homes that had been types that, you know, we were, you know, redoing the cabinets, but we were painting them, doing, you know, new fixtures. All I was just, a, you know, it was, it was a, a lot in the process. So it just took a while. So we went out and we networked again, found another contractor. Second contractor was good on price. Uh, good quality was, was great and communicated really well, which that was always important is communication. And so we start buying a couple, bought a couple more and he's doing it. And it was, it was going good. He then, and this is always a, a red flag. I've heard of this as a red flag. He then ends up I think going through some marital problems and ask for an advance of like $10,000. Now mm -hmm. I didn't develop, we'd done about four or five properties with him at this point and thought he's, you know, I trustworthy. I seems to be trustworthy. He's communicated well, blah, blah, blah. like help this guy, you know, help this guy out, you know? So we gave him 10,000 advance. Um, and that he still kept showing up and doing stuff, but as the divorce kind of went on and all that communication got worse and it, I, the mistake I made is I should have broken up the relationship much sooner. And I stayed in it longer. And in a nutshell, he ended up siphoning off about thirty to forty thousand dollars from us and work that he said that he did, and he didn't. And that, I, I, I mean, I blame him, yes, but I don't blame him. And that, like, some of that falls on me. Like, I've got to get there, and that's the hard part. Like, as soon as you start seeing something doesn't seem right, something's not lining up. But we were, 
at this time in the process, it was like acquire, acquire, acquire. It was yeah. all about acquiring and just kind of run. And, we, and I'm glad we did. And it cost $40,000. But I mean, once again, I still, we still had money in the bank. I own all those properties and I haven't, I've just put the $5,000 in. Mm-hmm. And so we were able to, you know, work our way through it. But kind of going through that kind of burn us out because we had run hard there for about two years, two and a half years. And, you know, going up there, you know, every other month, kind of a deal or more, you know. And I had I had some people that had eyes on the ground, boots on the ground to help out, but it was it was still just a lot of work. And so we kind of just paused. And it was a blessing too, because I think timing wise of the market, we know kind of what's happened. It was a perfect time for us to get everything finished up. Because it still took another year to kind of rehab some of the properties. We had some properties to make it for a year. Hmm. Um, and so it, it it took a while. Um, but we've kind of worked all that throughout now, and it's kind of running on its own as of now. But yeah, that's so, kind of why I exited out of Abilene or yeah. Paul's. So if you were to do it again, would you, would you do the distance thing again? How would you go about finding someone as far as a contractor, you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously references, would you just kind of do more of the background stuff? And, you know, there is just at some point, there's just a trust level, you know, that you have to go. If someone has a website and, you know, 90 Google reviews are probably really expensive. And so (laughs) finding guys that, you know, are still relatively cheap. And, you know, you can get in and, and make money on an investment property, but are trustworthy. It, it, it can be difficult. You know, I know for me, I have an amazing resource in Tavis and I've met a couple other investors who I respect. And so when they say, hey, this guy's good to go, you know, in general, they're good to go. And not to say they don't ever get burned because I mean, I yeah. know Tavis ha- recently, you know, he's gone through a few but you have this core of people that you can now you can go to your really, really good cheat rock guy and go, Hey, do you know a painter? I'm kind of short this next week or yeah. like you have that base there. So how would you go about doing it differently next time you think? Um, you know, the hard thing is the guy was great at first. So I don't know that I did anything wrong. He was great for the first four properties that he did. He just had, he had a life situation. I think the change I would have made is I got comfortable. It was nice. We had him, it, it did all the work. He communicated well. It was easy. Easy is not the right word. It was not stressful in our end. The idea of going and finding someone new, driving down there, meeting with them, doing all that was I let the comfort supersede whereas I should have fired him earlier. Mm-hmm. And so that probably cost me an additional 20,000. Once I knew there was 20,000 kind of gone and not spoken for, and uh, Hey, you said the floors. I'm looking at those. There's no floors. Yeah. I should have just cut the cord and I didn't. And yeah. some of that was one of the property, a couple of the properties were far out on the outskirts and it was hard, a little bit harder to get to. And, you know, he lived in that area. And so yeah. some of that yeah. was there. So, but going back, I would have cut ties earlier. Yeah. And it's tough, you know, d- just dealing with people. And this goes back to my dad, you know, it, one of his faults was he was just way too nice to people and to a fault business wise, because he would just trust, trust, trust. And a lot of times he ended up getting burned, you know, and uh, I, I would actually rather, you know, be in general, a, a person in life that probably trusts a little bit too much and gets along with people as opposed mm-hmm. to just always being the super cynic that just absolutely never gets taken advantage of. Uh, I would, I would rather be a balance of that, but if I was going to yeah. err on one of those, I would probably still err on the, Hey, if a guy calls up and says, man, I'm, I'm really struggling. Is there any way you can, you know, front me a little bit this week, I'll, I'll make good on it. I would probably do that at first. And maybe it just takes getting burned. I've actually had that happen where a guy that had done a good bit of work, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm running into a little bit of a problem. Is there any way you can, and, you know, it wasn't a ton, but it, it did raise that, 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 that those little hairs on the back of your neck. You're like, I better not get burned here. And yeah. uh, it, you know, that one worked out. So well, so y'all, y'all did Abilene, y'all pause there, y'all have the long-term rents there, you're doing great. And so take us into the next thing, which um, I feel like you've sort of, you've listened to, the, to bigger pockets and you're like, I can do that. I can do it. You house hacked your first one. You got into the long-term, you did some flipping, you got into the long-term. House hacked the, we house hacked the second one too. Let me give you the quick rundown of that, our personal property that we did. So we bought yeah. that one for, a t- it was almost, almost an acre that bell and pretty i mean in north yeah bell in north yeah. austin uh northwest austin and we bought it, it was a 1960s original house original super owner. cool house yep very cool house. it's 1300 something square feet and this was our biggest uh, you know takedown so far and that we did we took on a huge project so 
same thing. Okay, we use creative financing. So this is 2017. Um, okay. We use that for, and this is this is harder to do. But you have to, if you have a personal relation one, you can do this. We bought it for 270, but we got a loan on it for, from a friend for 350. So we ended up getting like a seventy thousand dollar check at closing when we closed on the house. Hmm. Now I'll get to why we did that in a second. So we've got about three hundred fifty thousand dollar loan. We do about a four to five month rehab. I'm GCing it myself, but I've got I'd start using some friends and all that connections to kind of some people to help guide me. But we take it down to the studs. Um, we convert the garage. Uh, we kind of, we we do a bunch. We open up walls. Um, and so it, it was around at that time we kind of finished off. I mean, we spent about $150,000. So we got a $70,000 check closing. I spent about $80,000 of our own from the proceeds of the other sale. And so at this point, we're all in, uh, I think so it was, yeah, so 80,000. So I'm all in for 80,000 of my own money. Um, and I've got a $350,000 loan on it and it appraises for 475. So like I just told you on the Abilene property, the commercial bank, they actually gave me money back. This is a personal residence. They wouldn't do that. So it's a rate and term refinance. So I've got my current rate, my current term, which was like a two year term, you know, to do the rehab and then finance out of it. And so I just went to the bank, got a traditional mortgage, a government backed mortgage that said, Hey, I just want to rate and term refinance. So they wouldn't let me take any money out of it. So even though it appraised for 475, they would technically give me a loan amount of like 380, but I only owed 350. So they would only give me 350. Hmm. So they give me the 350, uh, or basically pay that off. So I'm all in for 80,000 on a, at that time valued at 475,000. And so that's the equivalent of less than 20% down payment. But the trick is by getting the financing on the front end from my friend, I'm able to wrap in all those rehab costs yep. into my new loan. So had I bought it for 270,000, got a traditional loan, I'm then out of pocket that 150,000. Right. Yeah, unless banks I do don't do re- that. Yeah. Banks right, don't unless do that. Unless I go to bank, do a rehab that. loan, do all that. Yeah. Then it's complicated. You got to have a contractor, you know, your contractor shows bids, they take draws. It's, it, it can be done, but it's more of a complicated process. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that was then, and another thing I want to say is like, I have, my wife is involved in like this process and that's like the key component of like the design side of when you're doing flips and remodels, like there's an element of that, like understanding, I don't understand it. I don't understand textured walls and different colors and all that. Like I do now being married to her, but her being involved in that process really allowed, I feel like us to put out a product that was different than, I mean, if we're doing stereotypes, most rehab or flippers are men and you know, they, they just not as in touch with that kind of stuff. Traditional typically. Um, and so, but she's really good at that. And so like that was able using that and her partnering along with, with us and all that, like able to add value on each of those, where I feel like we were able to extrapolate as much as possible yep. out of the, the value add that we did. And so that was, that was really cool. Yeah. They definitely feel different. You know, Megan has a great eye. She had a staging business for a while and went away from that, but is now doing more of the traditional design stuff. Of course, I I pick her brain on on design on things. And, and you know, <clears throat> fast forward to the house y'all are in now. Y'all have done kind of a remodel of your current house, and it just Maybe. it feels different. It looks different. People who have uh, an eye for things. Now, I'll, I'll give you credit for this. You have a great eye for landscaping, and Tavis has a great eye for landscaping. And to me, that that's such an, a different thing too. You know, Megan's great at interior design and picking the right colors. And let's add this little feature. And that what's interesting there is like, you're taking this snapshot of a house and you're hoping that it ages well. And you're hoping that you get, you know, let's say eight to 10 years of really pretty decent modern field where you don't feel like you have to renovate it again. Mm -hmm. Landscape design is so different because it is a, an ever changing thing. And you, you have to take a snapshot when you first put it in and you want it to look pretty decent, especially if you're flipping. But then if you're, you know, you're hoping that over time it like grows into this thing and you've done, you're really good at it. Tavis is really good at it. They've kind of sort of seeing into the future and saying, this is going to fill out this way and this is going to look this way. So the combo between you, you know, you and Megan, especially there at the bell house, I mean, having an acre property in the middle of freaking Austin is unheard of. And uh, y'all could have, well, if that was, a current day development, they would have fit at least two, if not three houses onto that same little, that same little corner there. So, um, y'all, y'all really put that, y'all made that property 
I think highest and best use for sure. And when y'all sold it, it, it went well for you and you got into this house up in Round Rock. So, um, so in the process there, after you left Abilene and you're kind of doing the, the another house hack over at Bell, y'all decided y'all were thinking about moving. Oh, sorry. You're good. It completely took my screen away. There we go. So while you're in the process of house hacking Bell and y'all had kind of started thinking about moving and, you know, school districts and there was just, y'all had kids kind of all of life is kind of taking over. And it's like, Hey, do we want to be here long-term? And you're thinking about something else. So you decided to build a house, new build house. So take us into, you know, I know, I know the decision that went behind it initially, you're okay, let's just build a house. We're going to we maybe move for a while and maybe this isn't a forever home, but we're going to move into this new house over in Pflugerville and kind of talk about how you, you transition that, um, eventually. Ah, okay. So this is, this is where I go back to what we talked about in the beginning, like finding opportunities, you're in involved, you're doing this all the time, looking for opportunities in real estate. It's not just doing that. So I've had. This was 2000, I don't know, 21 and the market's going crazy. COVID's high. Everyone's looking to build, you know, get bigger houses. Everything's, you know, basically ripping new builds are, you know, people are paying a hundred thousand dollars over asking for new build construction. Hmm. And I had found a property for a client and got a good deal um, with Lennar and, uh, you know, was just talking with that lady and she, you know, made a good, made a really good relationship with the sales agent. And this is back when I don't know, you know, exactly what Dallas was like, but in Austin, I mean, you couldn't buy a new built house. Like they weren't mm -hmm. even selling it to investors. They only sell it to owner occupants. And so, um, but seeing the opportunity in this relationship I have with this lady, I was like, I'll, can I buy the house next door? And she's like, yeah. And she basically gives it to me without it going on the market. I, I, you know, I feel like it, that, you know, was a good deal. And so we just bought it. It was going to take nine months to build. My thought process was it was 5,000 earnest money. Like the market goes to complete crap. I'll, I'm, I'm fine losing five thousand dollars for this risk. Like mm -hmm. that's basically all that was at jeopardy. And so it takes about nine months to build. We build it. It's it, it was you know kind of a starter home, basically twenty four hundred square feet. So not starter in the size, but you know it just there was no fancy bells and whistles. Um, we didn't know exactly what we were going to do. How we we're going to do the same thing? Use private money to kind of buy it. And we ended up. It was right around the same time as we sold the, the, the acre property you were just talking about. So we moved into it temporarily as a temporary housing. And, and then well, all along with the long-term plan of turning it into an Airbnb. Airbnbs were big, you know, 2022, or sorry, 2020, 2021, all that. And we started kind of doing Airbnbs and it got popular. Um, and so we had looked at doing some and cinnamon chores in some different areas. And it just, it seemed too risky and didn't want to do it. And so I said, let's try it. You know, my wife and I talked about it and said, let's try it here. And it would be as a good placeholder for while we're transitioning between the houses ourselves. And so bought that, turned it into an Airbnb, still are operating as an Airbnb. My wife says, she, bless her heart, she does it, kind of runs with it and does everything. And it, it was making about $1,000 a month at one time. Now everything's pulled back on Airbnb stuff, all the craziness and all that, and their, their algorithm and how they write things. It's basically breaking even now. Hmm. And so we're just waiting to... Hey, when's the right time to put this on the market or what do we want to use this for? We've got, you know, got some money in it. And so when we need yeah. the money, kind of when the timing's right. Um, but that, those are just opportunity. We just travel. I mean, not travel. We just, I gave us temporary housing. Let's buy a house and not rent something for three months, mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of fill it in and be as creative. And that's where just, you just be creative. Think, think like an entrepreneur and not like within this box, right? Yeah. Like that's the, that's the fun thing. Each one of these are different games, different businesses. Yeah. Diversify, be smart, learn rents repeat when needed and fix when messed up and learn. Definitely. And so that, you know, so like I said earlier that, you know, the other agent, Ricky Carew, he says, you need to be your own best customer. You're, if you're in the, in, if you are a real estate agent, if you're out there in the world and you're looking at the MLS and you're talking to people, you start seeing what yeah. constitutes a decent deal the more you're around people and you learn, you know, I, I had a client that used their 401k to get into a house and I was like, wow, that's interesting. So I, I actually use that same method to get into my first flip. When you're around people and you see people structure certain deals and oh, I didn't know a bank would do that. Or I, I had no idea a friend would let you borrow that. You learn all these things. 
and you can then you can start getting creative. Your brain thinks like, you know, how could I make that work? I have an opportunity. Yeah. How can I make that work? You know, I'm looking at a a flip right now. Now Tavis is floating in the Caribbean. I have, you know, I've got a flip I really want to pull the trigger on. And I actually may call on, you know, I'm definitely going to talk to you about it today. But, you know, a couple of these other guys that have been on the podcast that live here, it's like, I may have them do, you know, help me run the number. Just say, okay, is this a decent deal? Because I think it is. Uh, it's, yeah. it's definitely a more expensive. But you start seeing these deals. It's like, okay, how would I, how can I make this work? How could this make sense? How much would I have to offer? Blah, blah, blah. So, um, so let's kind of transition as we're wrapping up a little bit. You still do traditional real estate. I actually uh, left your brokerage. You know, you, you have a kind of a small family brokerage. It's basically you and it was me for a while. And I think you're, uh, I know my, my mom had a, a, her license under you for a while. You have another family member, but it's relatively Indeed. small. You kind of do your own thing. And recently you kind of reconnected with a client that Megan had worked with on the staging side. And it's an investor. And so talk about as, as a real estate agent, like how working with this investor has, you know, worked out for you. How would you recommend someone maybe looking for someone similar in their market um, mm -hmm. and kind of the benefits of working with a, a really active investor in your market? Yeah. So my wife, when she started her staging business, the very first client she had was an investor that flipped houses and ended up being her best client that you know did quite a bit of did a lot of business with her over the three or four year period um and during that process you know i got to know them or would talk to them and and different stuff and they would sometimes at that time they were selling the house as their own um you know for sale by owner or they were putting it on the mls and i don't know how they were doing it but they were getting on the mls and selling it on their own and so from the time to time questions would come up and people who basically don't have representation you know they hey what do we do here what do we do here you know kind of deal so they would call me and ask my opinion i was always fine but happy to share they were they were great for my life and you know so i was happy to share so just kind of stayed connected with them through that answering questions well they left when the market got too tight and then they moved out um 2019 to san antonio uh but this year they kind of see an opportunity as the market shifts back that they want to start reinvesting in that into Austin. They own a bunch of rental properties here and, you know, are looking to kind of start buying and flipping again. And, well, they are. And so this time they're setting it up different. They're based out of San Antonio. They're not in Austin. And so they're taking more of approach like who can help us. And so they've kind of brought me on uh, to sell all their houses. And so through that process, I've kind of approached it like, Hey, this is a team effort. Like y'all win, I win. And you know, everything and all my communication, everything with them is we, it's us. It's, it's not you guys. It's there. It's like, we're building a team. I'm, there's a book I love called who, not how, and in this particular scenario, I'm the who, um, for them, uh, to get done of flipping properties. And, and, and so I'm happy to be that cause I'm learning so much, but from a realty perspective, I'm, I have one client. And that's unemotional to the property. So as you know, you know, oh, Becky, you know, loves this paint color. These floors are great. You know, people will say the house was remodeled. You get there and it's, yeah, it was remodeled 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so you got the emotion side that you're balancing. and like, I don't want to offend someone, but also you're like, hey, it's not worth 400,000, it's worth 350. Let me get you there. Well, working with an investor, the right investor, it's a little bit different. This investor is very conservative on their pricing. A lot of times I'm telling this, I think we should list a little bit more, which a lot mm -hmm. of times it can be the other way. Usually when I'm listing a seller, they overvalue their property. And so right. I go into that listing presentation going, I find out very quick, oh, you think it's worth this? I already know I think it's worth this. Now I've got to talk you off that ledge in a way that doesn't offend you. And then, you know, so it's just, there's a little bit more of a craft involved in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but with this investor, I don't have it. I, it's the same seller every time. I know their expectations and we've developed our systems. Um, okay, well, when staging happens, then I do this. And when this happens, I do that, you know, kind of a deal. And so it's been really nice. And I yeah. thought it, the market overall is in Austin. Like my business would be down about 40%, which is obviously not insignificant at all. Um, had this investor not come in, it's basically subsidized the retail side of things. My retail clients, just people, interest rates are this high. No one's moving. Things are locked down. No one wants to move and pay an 8% interest rate. So just overall volume is down. Um, but I've sold about eight, eight or nine houses already this, this year um, for the lender or for this investor. Yeah. And it's basically subsidized that. So it has made me thought like, man, maybe you go out and find just two of these. You kind of forget the retail side, mm -hmm. find two or three investors. Now that's going to ebb and flow with the market. So that's the risk side. Yeah. But working with this investor, I'm also getting hand to hand to see how they do it. They're making money. They're buying it. They're, 
they're paying a realtor, they're paying the contractors, they're doing all this locally. So it's kind of opened up my eyes of like getting to see how some of this is made, which I've done some myself, but it's yeah. also like I mean, everyone of these podcasts and this, you pick up different things and you create your own. Yeah. And so it, it's been really cool. It's not a bad idea for, I would say an experienced agent. You're going to be hard providing value if you're a new agent to an investor, other than you have the time, effort, and energy, you know, to put into it. Um, but really the knowledge expertise to kind of guide them, you know, helps if you, if you have some experience, you know, it's not a bad idea if you can get someone, you know, like even Tavis, if he didn't have his license and he's trying to build a business, he don't want to be selling on his own. Like he wants to work with someone he can trust, and it, sure. you know? So, yeah, I'm looking to hopefully work with some investors here, um, through bigger pockets. You know, they have their, their preferred agent. I've, I've tried it before. I'm about to try it again in the new year, just to try to pick up, you know, one or two now finding the the perfect mix of you're doing some volume. You don't have your license. Your wife's not a, you know, you're, is not an agent. You're not wanting to write 40 offers a week on certain random things. It's like, finding the right balance is great. But once you are out there and you find one or two of those, it could, like you said, I mean, change your business and you know, they can be a great, great partner when they respect what you're bringing and you respect their part and you're not pushing them all the time on price. And you're, you know, you, you could cut them a little bit of a deal on commission mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. You, it all works together. So it's awesome. Well, um, the thing I love about you is, is, one, it's very attainable. You know, you, you are just an agent who just, you know, you learned how to be an agent by getting out there, going to open, you're a big proponent of open houses. Just get out there, put the work in, go sit in an open house, go represent people. Now there's a lot of people out there. Well, I want to be a, a listing agent and I wanted this. There's always the perfect way to do it. But, and then sometimes it's just like, just go start doing business. And you, you figured that out. You know, you started doing open houses. You started representing people. You started picking up a decent client who referred you here and referred you there. You use some of your connections, but that's not what you, you don't, I, I know you personally, like if you didn't know you played UT football, you know, as a backstory, you don't, <laughs> you don't ever bring it up. Yeah. You don't use that to sort of just get stuff done. And that's what you hang your hat. You're not one of those guys that's living in the past who, who wears their championship ring around all the time. And yeah. that's like your only, I know that's not you, um, but you used your connections and you were creative enough to say, okay, how, how can I get this done? Who do I need to meet and order what, what knowledge do I need to gain? And it's just been piece by piece, but over the course of not a huge amount of time, you've been able to grow a very good traditional business. Plus you have, you know, 22 doors and an Airbnb and you're, you're currently flipping a project. I know right now, like you're doing it. And it's just so nice to see that it's not some weird, unattainable thing. It's, it's very, very doable, but you have to just start. You have to do that first project, that first house hack, the first creative finance little, uh, how do I get an extra 20 grand to go towards this deal? And you can figure those things out. So um, I definitely, you know, from a personal perspective, I've gained a ton of knowledge. You were like, as a broker, you taught me a ton. You helped me kind of get into my business. And as an investor, of course, you've helped me out a ton. So i um, super glad that you're, you know, you're a part of my life and you've added so much to me. Um, so as we're done here, like what are kind of the short-term, long-term goals? Like, what are you looking to do next? Are you are you just wanting to try to get back into more volume of flipping? Are you wanting to get into some long-term stuff? You know, what, what's your, <laughs> what's your big goal? Well, it's interesting. This is, so I got, and I was telling Megan about this, like I got really excited in 2019 when we started doing the Adeline stuff, like this was fun and it's excited. And then I've just kind of gone through the motions, just the real estate stuff and life and COVID and all this. And, um, but this year is the first year I've started to get really excited about kind of something else. I think we kind of hit a down cycle in the market. So I think it's a good opportunity to get in. And I'm trying to build something a little bit different on this front end. So doing some more flips, but you know, I told you I was, I was very, the very first one we did, I was very involved. Every kind of step along the process, I've gotten less and less involved, you know, as far as a day-to-day -day operation. And so like with this, like a flip that I'm, you know, working on right now, I brought in a partner who, who is a family member, but he's a contractor. And so we just did 50-50 on the deal. Uh, we're 50-50 partners. But then I'm doing I I'm doing all the front end and back end. So I do the acquisition. I got all the financing set up. They're just they can just focus on what they're good at, which is the contractor contracting stuff. 
So we've kind of got set the parameters, did all this, set our rehab, and then I've backed out. I haven't, I'm not choosing paint colors. I'm not doing floors. I'm, I'm letting, and, and my sister is involved in that process too, but, you know, kind of helps out with, with some of that. But I've kind of stepped back and said, like, this isn't, like, I kind of want to, you know, try to run this and operate this more from a high level perspective, which is more of a business where I can go be in the Caribbean for 10 days on a sailboat. Yep. <laughs> you know, that's yep. what I was saying. Like that, that's the five year goal, right? To get to that where you kind of have that freedom and you got those systems and those people. So it goes back to that. I mean, I'm real big in this book right now about who, not how, and it's figuring out not how you're going to get something done. It's, I mean, the basic premise is who's going to do it and how are you going to work and partner with those people to get that done? Because in the grand scheme, even though it's going to cost you initially, it's going to pay off in the long run. Yep. And so like trying to implement some of those things and build out a whole, you know, I want to get about six levels of income. And so we're going to do some flipping. We're doing some acquisitions. I think it's really exciting. I think actually something I heard from this podcast was Tavis talks about a lot of his relations and all his connections. He gets it from realtors. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never thought, why don't I can go back and call at, So part of my January, February plan um, is to call t is to call all the realtors that I've worked with in the past and tell them like, Hey, if you've got a property, I'll pay more than these wholesalers that yep. hit you up every day as a realtor will pay. Mm -hmm. And so start building those connections and those relationships where, man, if I can start getting acquisition properties, then I get one contractor here, I get another contractor here, then I can kind of pick and choose or I can go find, like you were saying, if, if you're a young realtor and you want to try to get an investor client that you can do repeat business with, go figure out, go find deal. Even if it's on the MLS, the, yep. the deal we're flipping right now, I bought off the MLS. It was listed for 360. I bought it for 280. Mm -hmm. It can be done with relationships. I didn't offer a low ball offer. I developed the relationship with the realtor, figured out like, oh, okay, there is definitely room to move on this. The seller needs to sell. I just stayed in contact for a three week period. And then he contacted me back and said, Hey, would, would you want to buy this? And I said, mm -hmm. Well, this is what I can pay. And then he come back two days later, came back and said, Yeah, they would pay that. Yep. As a, you know, they would accept that and we got a deal done. And yep. so as a new realtor, you could go and hey, that free. Just go talk to a whole bunch of other realtors and say yeah. you've got a client that did this. But don't do it like everyone else does. I get a text a day from wholesalers or an email a day saying, do you have any sellers who can't sell an MLS? Like, no, build that personal relationship, contact, do something. And then if you get that deal, if you get a deal, you can find an investor, you can find a client, you can find someone and implement it if it's a Absolutely. good enough deal. So go find the deal on the front end and then you can make whatever deal work. Yep. Yep. No so. doubt. Well, cool, man. I know we could talk about, as in the past, like you, you are very similar in my life as Tavis. We could sit there and talk about real estate for hours and hours. I'm sure our families very much appreciate that. Anytime we're, <laughs> we're together, that's pretty much what we talk about. And, uh, no. and I'm either, you're either over my shoulder helping me edit a contract at my mom's 70th birthday party, or, you know, we're talking <laughs> about, we're talking about real estate, uh, before Christmas and all that stuff. So uh, man, love you. You've, you've, you've done so much for me. I, I know you guys have tons and tons of, uh, projects in the future. And so I want to keep tabs with you. I will definitely have you on uh, next time Tavis is out. We'll just have you on as a, as, as my co-host and we can kind of do more of a broad, uh, uh, real estate, you know, journey. Cause you're right down the road and I, I want to come down and do some videos of your stuff. So, uh, as y'all are, as y'all are making progress, I want to share your success and, and make sure that everybody knows about it. Cause I think y'all are doing a great job, but um, tell everyone how I they can get in touch with you. I appreciate that. They, I'm, I'm excited for you too. And just your journey and steps that you're taking. And yeah, you know, I think you just keep trudging for always look forward, right? Like learn from the past and then look forward. I think that gives us hope of what, what's the next opportunity. What are you doing? You know, just kind of to push through for sure. Um, I'm not, not super big on social media and all that. I got mixrealty.com, uh, M I K S C H realty.com. Uh, it's kind of my website. Uh, and then my Instagram handle is when my wife does that. I think it's mixed realty. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. Yeah. You uh, want to give out your phone up. number? Is that probably the best way to, for people to get in touch with you is your phone number. Is that, you want to do that? Yeah. Phone number 512-632-5805. Got any questions or I can help out in any way. I like just helping people, you know? Yeah. yeah. If you're in the Dallas area and you have a deal that you find down in Austin, you need someone to run comps, you want someone to go look at it. You want to partner on a deal. Dustin is your guy. And, uh, you know, randomly I've said before the Abilene market is on the Dallas MLS. And so we see all the Abilene stuff over here. So if you, if you have questions, if you've ever thought about investing in Abilene and you want to partner over there, I'm sure Dustin would, would love to, uh, you know, team up on that too. So, all right, man. Well, I appreciate everything. Hope you guys, 
uh, that are listening. Have a great day. I'm Ashton Hines, Dallas Real Estate Guy on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. You can find Tavis Westbrook, Travis without the R, mostly on Facebook. And these days, he has a cocktail in hand, and he is showing the beautiful waters of the Caribbean on an amazing boat. So tune in, check out Tavis for the next week or so as he's uh, showing us the high life. And then he will be back. Uh, between now and then, I'm going to try to get another episode out. But with the holidays and then uh, me being out, him being out, it's been a little bit weird. But we will definitely keep coming to you with a podcast. We've got a lot of things planned for this next year. And we we'll love you. Thank you so much. Share it with a friend. We really much appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye.